If you would, turn over to the uh, book of Micah, fourth chapter, and we'll begin at uh, verse 9. <clears throat> Before we do, though, let's have a short word of prayer. And Father, bless us as we study thy word. Again, we're grateful for the prophets of old who left their instructions with us that we may learn thy will for us. We pray for this country that it may not repeat the errors of so long ago. And bless us as thy children that we may be that light that cannot be hid, the city upon the hill. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> You know, I got to thinking that uh, <clears throat> one thing we should uh, remember is that these prophets were real people. They just, I wouldn't say exactly like me and you, but they, uh, they were real people. And they were dealing with situations not too unsimilar to what is going on today. And there's always a political context in which they operated, and there's certainly a political context today. So this is telling us not only how God dealt with the people of that day, <clears throat> but because there are similarities between the uh, people of this day and the people of today, and it's always been has always been the case. Then it tells us how God will deal with uh, not only this country but all countries that operate in a in uh, disobedience to His will. But anyway, He's uh, here in verse nine. He's talking about. Again, about those who are taken off into captivity. He said, why, why do you cry aloud? And they will be some crying. <clears throat> Is there no king in your midst? No, there's not a king in their midst. The king's been taken away. How's your counselor perished? Well, counselor's not going to do you any good. For pangs have seized you like a woman in labor. <clears throat> I understand that's the case, but, you know, it's just hearsay. <clears throat> be in pain and labor to bring forth. They're in labor, but they can't seem to bring forth the child. So they continue in pain. Be in pain and labor to bring forth or daughter, uh, daughter of Zion. Again, daughter of Zion or da daughter of Jerusalem uh, just means the people that, that are the subject of this uh, prophecy. Oh, daughter, like a woman in birth pangs, <clears throat> you, you, you can't deliver, so you just continue in pain. For now you shall go forth from the city, and no longer have the protection of the city, and you shall dwell in the field. Well, you know, you, you recall that uh, a lot of those cities of old always had walls around them. That, that was protection, that was security. So if you have to dwell out in the field, you don't have security anymore. And then, and you shall go even to Babylon. So Babylon is the place that they're going to be taken to captivity. And this is a hundred or so years in the future. You know, Babylon at this point in time was not even, it was a vassal of Assyria. It wasn't a separate country, if you want to call it that. There you shall be delivered. And the Lord was going to do the delivering, and it wasn't going to be pleasant. But also there, the, the Lord will redeem you from the hands of your enemies. So they're going to Babylon, and they're, they're going to come from Babylon. It's not going to be all of them. It's going to be a remnant. <clears throat> Never promised that all of them would come back. And verse 11, Now also many nations have gathered against you. Usually when you see the word nations, you're talking about the, uh, the heathens, the... Uh, uh, Canaanites, uh, Ninevites, and all, all those heathen nations. You have many nations gathered against you, and they want her to be uh, defiled. Who so, say, let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. 
But the Lord said he's going to redeem them, at least a remnant anyway. So even though these uh, uh, heathen nations around about them want them to be destroyed, they don't know the thoughts of the Lord. That was not the idea that uh, the Lord had in mind. They don't understand the Lord's counsel either. So he's going to gather them like sheaves to the threshing floor. And he says again to the daughter of Zion, Arise and thresh, talking about those nations around about them. And I will make your horn iron and make your hooves bronze. They're going to be very strong in their threshing, and you shall beat in pieces many peoples. And I will consecrate their gain to the Lord and their substance to the Lord with the whole earth. And whatever these people have gained is going to be consecrated, consecrated to the Lord. And if you think about it, uh, the like the Assyrians, they were God's instruments in His hand to punish the uh, Judah and what was their compensation it's all the things that Judah had all their treasures so they were going to be compensated and this is gain to the Lord and verse 5 chapter 5 Now gather yourself in troops, O daughter of troops. Again, this uh, uh, imagery of the daughter, it's, it's the people. He has laid siege to us, against us. And they will strike the uh, judge of Israel with a rod on the cheek. Well, these troops are going to gather around. They're going to lay siege to Jerusalem. Yeah, which eventually happened. But rather than completely destroy the nation of Judah or the uh, Jews, it's going to be a strike on the uh, judge of the people, the, the king and what have you of the people, with a rod on the cheek. That's not a fatal blow. So there's going to be a remnant that's going to, to return. And here, again, there's always a, a message of hope in these prophecies so here uh, verse 2 of chapter 5 but you Bethlehem Ephrathah though you are little among the thousands of Judah all the settlements of Judah and it was not a very significant place of course it was the uh, birthplace of King David Yet out of you, you're little among thousands, but yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. So there's, this is certainly a messianic uh, prophecy, and the uh, scribes and of old knew that the uh, Christ was going to come from Bethlehem. And of course, when Christ was, was uh, from Galilee, they didn't know he was born in Bethlehem. He's from Galilee. They, they didn't believe that he was, he was the Christ. But this, uh, who's going forth, have been from old, from everlasting. That puts him in another realm than just uh, someone that uh, you know, being born, this everlasting. This is even before the beginning of everything. Everlasting. He's always been there. So this one that's uh, going to be the ruler of Israel, he's always been there. He's always been there from eternity. And this is also... Uh, before we, we talked about the uh, former dominion over in verse 8 of chapter 4. It's even before that. It's from the very beginning of, of time. Therefore he shall give them up until the time that she who is in labor has given birth. 
And again, talking about uh, Judah. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return to the children of Israel. Again, there's going to be a remnant that's going to return. Not everyone is going to return. And again, talking about this one who's born in Bethlehem, the one to be ruler in Israel. Then he shall, uh, in verse 4, and he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they shall abide, and now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and this one shall be peace. You know, and uh, Isaiah calls him the Prince of Peace, and Paul called him our peace, so he's, he's talking about the Messiah. And we will go down for a lot of the chapter 5 and uh, at least chapter 5 and in other place too, really it will refer to this one born in Bethlehem. So always keep that in mind. It becomes kind of the theme for the rest of the, of the book. Not all of it, but most of the rest of the book. Anyway, this one uh, shall uh, be peace. He'll be great uh, throughout the entire earth. Uh, when the Assyrian comes into our land and when he treads in our palaces, then we will raise against him seven shepherds. Again, it's talking about this one that's born in Bethlehem. We will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men. Now, who are the seven shepherds and the eight princely men? Well, they're not really specified, but uh, we do know that seven is a perfect number. It's a complete number. So it's a, a number of shepherds that can do whatever the job that there is that assigned to do. And eight is one more than perfect. So again, it's a uh, description of of what will happen when this one in Bethlehem comes on the on the scene. They shall waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances, and they shall, and he shall deliver us from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and we tread when he treads within our borders so again when you're talking about the wasting with the sword of the land of Israel uh, of Assyria uh, again it's talking about this one that's coming he's going to by the sword of his uh, mouth he's going to lay waste to the land of uh, Assyria and Assyria, the physical Assyria, is going to be laid waste in the land of Nimrod. And uh, the remnant will be delivered from the Assyrian when he comes into their land and he treads within in their borders. So, again, the one that's going to be born in, in uh, Bethlehem is going to overcome all of this. Then chapter, verse 7, Then the remnant of Jacob shall be in the midst of many peoples. Now, it's not just the uh, peoples of uh, Judah, the place that were returned, but uh, many uh, non-Jewish people, too. So this remnant, they're going to be, and of course Jews are scattered everywhere, but they're going to be scattered, well, throughout all the countries and it's just going to be like uh, dew on a grass you know how dew just uh, forms uh, everywhere it's going to be like dew from the Lord so this remnant is going to be spread among a lot of different people and again uh, the uh, this one born in Bethlehem is going to be spread among many people as a result it can be like dew from the Lord like showers on the grass that tarry for no man. No man's going to inhibit uh, these things from happening. 
nor wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles. And uh, Jacob is just a euphemism for both Israel and uh, Judah. The Jews are going to be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples. Like a lion among the beasts of the forest, <clears throat> like a young lion among flocks of sheep, going to be uh, everywhere, and their presence is going to be felt, known. Like a young lion among flocks of sheep, who, if he passes through, both treads down and tears in pieces, and none can deliver. These things are going to happen, and they're, they're not going to be uh, delivered from uh, these things that are, that are going to, to happen. And your hand shall be uh, lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies shall be cut off. This is going to be a uh, force that cannot be denied. And it shall be in that day, well, what's that day? The, the things that have just been talked about, the one that's going to be uh, in Bethlehem, it shall be in that day, says the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from your uh, midst and destroy your chariots. Now, anytime you hear, you know, horses and chariots, you're talking about uh, instruments of war. I will cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds. So this cutting the, off the horses and midst and destroy your chariots. Again, the one that's coming through Bethlehem, his uh, presence is not going to be through the force of arms. You know, all the uh, swords are going to be made into plowshares, that sort of deal. So he's not going to use the force of arms to uh, make his presence known. And two, he's going to cut off all the cities yeah, this is a the power of the influence of this one, you know, back in uh, verse 2. This is the power of the one that, that's coming to be the ruler in Israel. He's going to cut off all the cities of the land. Uh, he's going to throw down all the strongholds. And in this new um, environment, which, by the way, is a spiritual environment, there are not going to be any sorcerers in this uh, uh, in their hands, and they're not going to have any soothsayers. It's going to be different. There, there's not going to be any carved images in this, uh, if you want to call it the kingdom, what you did become. Not going to be any carved images. They're going to be cut off. Not going to be any sacred pillars in their midst. And it's going to be done away with. And they're not going to worship the work of their hands. The idols are going to be gone. And I will pluck your wooden images from your midst. <coughs> Thus I will destroy your cities. Nothing will be able to stand up against it. And I will execute vengeance and anger and fury on the nations that have not heard. So everyone will be subject to this uh, judgment, to this influence, if you will. No one can escape it. And if they uh, ignore it, then they will be destroyed. Chapter 6, hear now what the Lord says. Now here is a, we get to a, a uh, almost a... Uh, uh, a criminal case or a lawsuit or uh, this is going to be tried in court. So this is what the Lord is saying. He's presenting his case before a jury. He says, Arise, plead your case before the mountains. And he's getting back to, to the uh, people of Judah. Arise, plead your case before the mountains and let the, he the hills hear your voice. 
Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint, and you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has complained against his people, and he will contend with Israel. Now, why is he making his case before the mountains and the hills? Well, of course, you know, it's a, it's a representative of something else. The mountains and the hills have always been there. They've been through it all. They were there from the very beginning. So they were witnesses, witness to all the things that God has done for his people. So he's saying, you know, you go make your case to them. Let them testify as to what I've done. In verse 3, Oh, my people, what have I done to you? Well, it's a question that needs to be asked. And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. The mountains and the hills are going to be witnesses. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. And time and time again, he will go back to what he did for them when they were in Egypt. Because they didn't do it themselves. It was by his power that he uh, brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they knew it. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent uh, before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. He provided the leaders to uh, lead them out of the, the land of uh, Egypt. And oh, my people, remember, remember how when Balak, Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him? Well, you recall the story of that where uh, Balak uh, sent for Balaam to curse the people and instead of cursing them he blessed them so they should remember that and from Acacia Grove to Gilgal uh, Acacia Grove was the uh, last place that the Israel Israel camp before going over the Jordan River and then Gilgal was the first place that they camped after they crossed the, the Jordan River. And of course, you know, the Jordan was at, uh, during flood stage, and the Lord, you know, stopped the flow and allowed them to go across on dry land. And they should remember that. It wasn't by that power that they did that. It's through the power of the Lord. He did that that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Verse 6, For well, what shall I come before the Lord? And of course, uh, Micah is re replying this almost um, on behalf of the nation. Even though he's doing it in the first person, he's really doing it on behalf of the nation. He said, what, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? And it's an interesting note here that... Uh, uh, even though you know, Micah is speaking for the people, the people didn't know how to respond. You know, they had to make a case against God. They couldn't do it. But they don't know how, they don't know what they should do, uh, which is a testament to their ignorance. He said, with what shall I come before the Lord? They should know. And bow myself before the high God. Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Well, is that what the Lord wants? Would that do it? Well, the answer is no. With calves a year old, and you'll see a progression here of things more and more. With calves a year old, will the Lord be pleased with a thousand with thousands of rams? They're upping the uh, the ante, if you will. Or 10,000 rivers of oil. It's uh, olive oil. And olive oil is a very uh, precious commodity back then. And shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my, my body for the sin of my soul? Well, of course, that wouldn't be the case because that's an abomination to the Lord. <clears throat> they were willing to do almost anything 
except what God required. That's the one thing that they were not, were not willing to do. He has shown you, old man, what is good. That is, uh, what's good is a uh, uh, penitent heart, one that's uh, disposed to please God. And this is one of the most uh, sublime statements of the uh, Old Testament. And what does the Lord require? And that's what they were trying to get at. You know, what do you require, Lord? I mean, you know, we'll, we'll give you all these things. What do you require? And they weren't really, really willing to give what he required. But here's what he, he requires. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Now, to walk uh, justly is to do uh, uh, the right things, the righteous, do righteousness, uh, to do things both to God and man as what uh, righteousness uh, requires. And to love mercy, that's a loving kindness towards uh, a fellow man, you know, doing those things which are beneficial to the, um, the fellow man, uh, kindly disposed fellow man, and to walk uh, humbly with your God. And, and to walk humbly is, to walk is to submit to somebody's will. You know, you're, you're doing the things that they want, but humbly is to do it with the right attitude, with a uh, proper attitude of penitence and recognition that God is the uh, provider of all these good things and, and He is the Creator and we owe Him our obedience. That's to walk humbly with your God. The Lord's vo voice cries to the city, Wisdom shall see your name. Only the wise will give heed to what uh, has been said. And you hear the rod, it's a uh, punishment coming. And who has appointed it? Well, God has appointed it. In verse uh, 10, are there, yet the, are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked? Well, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. And the short measure that is an abomination short measure, measures are used in, in business. Shall I count the pure those with the wicked balances? Again, that's used in business transactions. And with the bag of deceitful weights. Well, the rhetorical answer is no. For her rich men are full of violence. Her inhabitants have spoken lies and the tongue is dece deceitful in their mouth. So the rich men, and uh, whether we like it or not, a lot of rich men uh, abuse the poor. That's not always the case. And it's not riches that make them do it. It's their own disposition of heart. But riches allow them the latitude to uh, do uh, evil things. And they... they her inhabitants, Jerusalem has spoken lies, and, and their tongue is, again, deceitful in their mouth, and the tongue lies. And therefore I will also make you sick by striking you and making you desolate because of your sins. You know, the things that they valued are going to be taken away. You shall eat, but not be satisfied. They're not going to have enough to eat whenever this uh, punishment comes. Hunger shall be in your midst. You may carry some away, but you're not going to save them. You can't store them up. And what you do rescue, I will give over to the sword. So whatever you try to save, somebody else is going to take it away. You're going to sow, but not reap. You shall tread the olives, but not anoint yourselves with oil. And make sweet wine, but not drink wine. For the statues of Omri or kept this. Now, Omri was the uh, father of Ahab, and he introduced the uh, uh, Baal worship. 
And of course, uh, Ahab kind of perfected it. <laughs> For the statues of Omri are kept. All the works of Ahab, Ahab's house are done. And you walk in their councils. Well, what were they counseling? They wouldn't uh, be to God. That I may make you a desolation and your inhabitants a hissing. Therefore, you shall bear, bear the reproach of my people. So they're going to be punished. It's a pretty much obvious. And it goes on in chapter 7, says, Woe is me. Now, is it uh, Micah that's saying that for himself or the, for the people? Uh, likely for, for the people he just started talking about, been talking about. Woe is me, for I am like those who gather summer fruits. And I understand that, uh, you know, kind of summer fruits were beyond the period of ripeness towards the end of the season and that they're not the best fruits to be gathering. So I'm like those who gather summer fruits, like those who glean vintage grape. Well, they're trying to glean, but there's no cluster to eat. Now, the first ripe fruit which my soul desires, the faithful man has perished from the earth. So there's not going to be a first ripe fruit that he wants. He's not going to be there. The faithful man has perished from the earth. Or so it seems. There's always a few faithful, but uh, the country is so corrupt that it's hard to find any faithful people. There's no one upright among men. They all lie and wait for blood. Every man hunts his brother with a net. So you get an idea of the type of uh, conduct that these people engage in. Every man hunts his brother with net that they may successfully do evil with both hands. Now they're all in. When you're doing it with both hands, you're all in. The prince, and we get uh, these uh, three uh, acting together, and then there's a fourth one later on. The prince asked for gifts. Well, he's acting for gifts from those who can, uh, uh, who, who need a favor. The prince asks for gifts. The judge seeks a bribe because he's passing judgment between two uh, contending parties. And the great man utters his evil desires. Well, that's who the judge is seeking a bribe from, from the great man. And so they all scheme together. The best of them is like a briar, and the most upright is sharper than a thorn hedge. Have you ever been in a... Uh, a briar patch. <laughs> that's what, where these people are. And the day of your watchman and your, that's the fourth one, the day of your watchman, you know, the watchman has a duty to proclaim when danger is approaching. The day of your watchman and your punishment comes. The watchman is not going to warn them. Now shall be their perplexity. And let's start in verse 5 of chapter 7 next time.